morning. Welcome to our Sunday school lesson this morning. And by my time, it's 7.31, in fact, so a few people still coming in, but I think we'll uh, get started on that. So this is um, my first Sunday school for a while, and i uh, going to introduce a short topic that we're going to discuss probably over four or five weeks. It could be a little longer, but there's only four Sundays left for me to teach Sunday school today, two weeks' time when Pastor Sam will be away teaching, and then uh, November, December, so four lessons this year. So we may not finish this, we'll see how it goes, maybe we will in, in the new year later in first week in February when we start again. We will see. So uh, let's start our day with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this, your day. We thank you and we pray that you would fill our hearts with joy and anticipation as we wait to hear from you, from your word, as we worship you together, as we break bread together. We long to see our hearts quickened and excited and ready to receive your precious word. We pray be with us in this day of worship. Be with our Sunday school teachers. Bless them as they teach the little ones and save our children, we pray. Bless our time together as we discuss this important subject, for we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So what, what I want to do over the next few weeks, which will take a few months, a few weeks of teaching, is um, talk about this book primarily, but not only, so I'm not tying myself into this book but this is a book that inspired me and has been inspiring me for some weeks. I read this book some time ago and thought, this is what Christians need to know. And this is a refresher uh, like in, uh, about worship. And I just think it's a wonderful subject. It's an important subject. I'm just going to introduce it today and have one point, the importance of worship. And we're going to talk a bit about the different aspects of worship we're going to talk about things that we are going to talk about in detail later. So, uh, you're welcome to get hold of this book on Amazon if you like. It's uh, fairly cheap. What happens when we worship Jonathan Laundry Cruz? Um, it won't be much of a help to bring it to Sunday school, but it's certainly a, a, a good resource to use. I'm not sure how closely we're going to follow it, but it's certainly the topics in here is what have grabbed my heart and uh, perhaps change some of our thoughts and our thinking about worship. What else can we read on that? Very well-known book, A.W. Tozer has written a number of books on worship, his original one, a very good book. I can't find my copy, so I've got to go through my library again and perhaps get another copy. Another book that may be helpful uh, is John MacArthur's The Worship, The Ultimate Priority. In fact, I quote uh, as we start from his book, but I've not read that recently in its entirety, so I'm not recommending it, but it certainly has, will be helpful in some areas if you wanted to read some more. So the importance of worship, and we're going to talk about worship over the next few weeks. And I quote, worship is any essential expression of service rendered unto God by a soul who loves him and extols him for who he is. Real worship should therefore be full-time, should be the full-time, full non-stop activity of every believer. And the aim of the exercise ought to be to please God, not merely entertain the worshiper. And that's quite a helpful quote, I think, although our focus is not going to be so much of, of outside and our lives should be lives of uh, worship dedicated to God, but in particular, the Lord's Day and our worship on His Day, that's what we want to focus on in the next few weeks, the importance of worship. And Jesus quoted from, quoting Deuteronomy in Mark chapter 12, uh, called this the greatest commandment. Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And surely, this is a call for worship and is identified by the Lord Jesus Christ as one of the foremost, the foremost of God's commandments. And then, of course, we can look at Exodus. In Exodus, 
uh, chapter 20, when the Ten Commandments are given, the very first commandment calls for and regulates worship. Listen to it, Exodus 20, 2 to 5. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Worship is inferred. You need to worship, but no other gods. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or likeness of anything in the heaven above or the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth shall not bow down to them and serve them, implying you shall only bow down and serve me, for I am the Lord your God. I am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation, those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to those who love me and keep my commandments. And this is the first commandment, and it's a call to worship, isn't it? But that's not yeah, because the whole scripture, surely the whole theme of scripture is geared towards this. From creation through to the final consummation of all things in Revelation, that all God's creatures should worship him. And one of the main purposes of the New Testament church for whom Christ died is that through our sanctification, this is the final aim. And what is that? that we should be better worshippers. Everything in the New Testament church is preparation, is sanctification, that we might appear before him, see him as he is, become like him, and worship him day and night with all the heavenly beings forever. That's why this is an important subject. That's why even as Reformed Baptists, we're very good about our worship, aren't we? Uh, need to consider this subject. These are the believer's priorities, the holiness without which no one will see God, and acceptable worship of God in spirit and in truth. And these are words we know so well, but what do they really mean? How do they really impact my Sunday day of worship? So even in our holiness, our growth in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ is to be the, to this end, that we might be better worshippers of God through a greater knowledge of God and experience of Him in our lives. This is the live and do this of the gospel, which gives us freedom in Christ, freedom to worship Him correctly in the place of do this and live. In the Old Testament, the law, which only leads to, to death, the sacrifices, the washings, the ceremony, the tabernacle, the exactness, very important thing. Do these things perfectly and live. They lead to death, but in Christ, we live and we do this. And why do we live? We live to worship God, both in our daily lives and how we, in a sanctified manner, in the world, live and especially what we want to consider in the formal worship on the Lord's day with his people as we are commanded both in the Old and the New Testament. And this worship of God, which we know very well, was carefully regulated in the Old Testament. In the New, we just have perfect freedom. We do what we like. No, is also regulated by Christ and the apostles in the New Testament. And one of the important things, and I know I'm throwing out a lot of different thoughts here today, I want to get your minds thinking and excited about proper worship and think correctly about worship. What is important is no longer the place, but the gathered people of God. For the dwelling of God is with men, and which are in the new covenant here in worship, the new covenant promises are guaranteed through that heart of flesh given us by the work of the Spirit so that his people respond to the summons by God to come and worship him. They are ready to respond and they want to respond. And on his day when the call to worship comes, we are excited and we wait expectantly for him. And when we gather, when God's people gather, on the first day of the week, 
we step into the very presence of God. But God is everywhere. Yes, He's everywhere. And God is with you in the workplace. And God is with you when you pray and with your family. But when we come to His house, He summons us. And we step into His presence on the first day of the week to sing praises, to pray, to hear the word read and preached, to attend to Christ's ordinances, baptism, and the Lord's Supper. These elements, if you like, that the New Testament gives us is practicing what Christ taught us. Those who worship the Father must worship him in spirit with our whole hearts and in truth according to the way that he has regulated this for us. So just, I'm nursing a cold, so I've got a lot of meds which keep me bad dry. And so, this is the only regulation, these things that I've just mentioned, of our worship given in the New Testament. That is what we as Reformed Baptists call the regulative principle of worship. And we'll talk more about that in later lessons. But basically, we do not have the liberty to introduce other elements into our worship, even with our best intentions, just as the holy fire presented by Eli's two sons, uh, Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu in, in Exodus, in Leviticus 10. Let me read that passage to you. These people were worshiping God. These sons wanted to come to God with something that he hadn't commanded in worship. Now, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, laid incense on it, and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord which he had commanded, not commanded them. Fire came out before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Worship of God is important, and that's the point. And we need to get it right. This is what we want to focus our attention on over the next few lessons, which will be normally on the first day of the month, but our next one will be in two weeks' time. And as I said, the title of this book, What Happens When We Worship, has inspired me to present these lessons and is a part of what we need to understand when we come to the Lord's house to worship him on his day. In part, to answer that question, what happens when we worship? And if I had to put that question to you this morning and ask, what do you think, what happens when we worship? I'm not going to put you on the spot. But as we come to think about the biblical answer to these questions, this should be a good start for us to think correctly about uh, worship, particularly on the Lord's Day. And if our worship has become dull and even tiresome, rather than a joy and a delight, a day of refreshment and rejuvenation, God's intended object for our Christ-centered worship, the strengthening of our faith through the means of grace. And when we think carefully about this, I'm hoping it will revolutionize our worship, and hopefully we will realize that it's not programs and constant changes. Let's change things up. It's getting a bit boring in the church. Or perhaps more emotional music and man-made things that will capture our attention Let's be a little more in step with the world and popular with the worship trends, but rather the what is the God prescribed way to worship? What is it to worship God in spirit and in truth? So back to that question, what happens when we worship? What would your answer be? Well, you would probably say we sing, we pray, we listen to the scriptures being read, we listen to the word preached. We observe the Lord's Supper. And, you know, perhaps there's be a baptism. And then we have some fellowship and we go home. And every week, we just kind of do the same thing repeatedly. And you may add that this is good. Habit is good. And this is an exercise. And it's what's commanded. So even if we don't feel like it, this is what we should do. And then, if you were honest, you may even say, sometimes I just feel like I'm coming to watch somebody perform up there. 
he reads and he preaches and he prays. We stand up and sing, and yeah, they, they are sing. And because of this, sometimes I find it boring. Because, you know what, it's, it's not really the pastor I like to be leading. I prefer that pastor to lead, and I wish this pastor were preaching and, and not that one. But all this is good. We are serving God. But if that is all the church is, no wonder the church for hundreds of years have been looking for different ways to make it more interesting and to change things up and to stay in step with the world and, and look at the thousands of cars parked outside these mega churches. And perhaps we need to introduce a band with the singers up there and a bit of swing and a worship time ahead of, of church. I wonder what that even means. A little drama, perhaps, in church. And if you're very conservative, you may think some more bells and smells. And I've been surprised that some people have wanted to go to more formality and liturgy and more uh, and different strokes for different folks, perhaps. If that's all church is then something is terribly wrong about church. This is not what is supposed to happen when we worship. And we'll see that this is not primarily what is happening when we worship God in spirit and in truth. This is not the true worship that should flow from our heart, informed of the glorious deeds of the Lord and the knowledge of the person, the only person that should be our focus on the Lord's Day, the person of our Holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, who summons us to worship. And as soon as it becomes about things and more elements, and let's just get this guy to preach all the time. He, he's so good. We've lost focus of what true worship ought to be. That's why it's important to ask the question, what happens when we worship. And what does worship that is acceptable to God in the 21st century look like in America or across the world? And so I want to whet your appetite a little bit for the study ahead of us. And uh, a lot of these thoughts are, are not mine. They are from the book, and, and they've just resonated with my heart and have slowly been changing the way that I view worship. And it's different for a pastor because it's a day of work for him, or, most, uh, or many parts of the day, a day of work for him. But Michael Horton, who's from Westminster, California, um, Westminster Seminary, California, if he's still there, he wrote the foreword to this little book, and I want to uh, talk a little bit about what he says in the foreword. Listen to this. More important than any other distinctive of Reformed worship is that we come primarily not to serve, but to be served by God the Father in His Son through the power of the Holy Spirit working through His Word. Just as Jesus did in John 13. What did He do? He comes to wash the disciples' feet. And so when we come to worship, Jesus comes to give us his kingdom, to make us a part of his kingdom. He announces to us full pardon and justification by grace alone, simply on the basis of what he has done. Jesus is present in the word as it is preached and sung and read and given in baptism and the supper. And if we are told by the Apostle Paul, you may recall the passage in Romans 10, that we do not need to climb up to heaven to bring him down to be with us in worship. We do not need to descend into the depths to somehow make him alive and present with us. Lord, come and be with us. No, God says, come and worship me. Step into my presence. I am here. It's not about, okay, now I must come. I, I, I've come. I've responded to the summons. I step into his presence. The passage go, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. We as Reformed Baptists place so much emphasis 
on the word in our worship because it is through the gospel and the spirit that creates and sustains the faith of long-time believers. That's what's happening when we come and worship. It's through the word of Christ in which he sustains the faith of long-time believers and outsiders who come into the church. Not because they hear there's a great band and a half an hour just chorus singing and closing your eyes. And No, this is what is happening. That's every service, of course, should be evangelistic. And he makes the point that there is definitely an important part. And again, this is just a side note for, for praise in the worship service. But as we see in the Psalms, which is our inspired book of praise... God's work must be set before us before we have anything to praise Him for. And unfortunately, in many modern churches, we hear the musical part of the service, and as a Baptist from South Africa, our worship time ends when the preaching starts. What? <laughs> we got it wrong. So we go into modern churches today, and, and the, the, this musical part of the service referred to the worship time, and in many cases, the time devoted to reading and exposition of scripture and confession and prayer pale into comparison with the wonderful experience of the individualistic band and the music and the singers that capture our attention. The Bible teaches that we sing not merely to express our piety to God, but again to receive. We don't get this. Colossians chapter 3, 16, you know it so well. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart before God. We're not just expressing our feelings to God, but we are addressing one another in worship and in praise. This is why... We should cherish the singing of the Psalms especially. For there's a song for every occasion in the Psalms. It's not all joyful praise. There are also agonizing laments, honest questioning, and spiritual depression in the Psalms. And our Christian experience is a mixed bag. It's a relationship with the Father in Christ so we should be able to relate honestly with God together and have our eyes lifted together in hope by his promises. And of course, there's a very there's an important part of fellowship, and many people ask this question, isn't fellowship a means of grace? But it certainly is one of the results of the means of grace. And, and this fellowship amongst believers is not the shared cultural influences or ethnic or the socioeconomic or political affinities that you may have, and not by the kind of music that you love. That's why I'm going to go to that church, because I like this kind of music. It just gets my soul. No, what is our fellowship? It is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, as expressed in Ephesians 4 and verse 5. Well, I've been talking too much, but these are some of the things that we plan to consider in this study and to suffice to say and press to our hearts for today the importance of worship and the question, what happens when we worship? And, and we'll consider that in the next lesson in two weeks' time. And as we go through the study, let's bear these important things in our minds, educate our minds with the word of Christ that our hearts may be moved by his Holy Spirit to transform our worship in the way that was intended to be on his day. A day, not, we say the Lord's day, but it was a day made for us and for our benefit. A day we do not primarily come to serve him, but a day when God, by his word and by his spirit, ministers to our hearts and our souls and our minds. And when we respond with joyful praise and thanksgiving, for all that he has done, for all that he continues to do in our hearts and in our lives, when we step into his presence, when we come into his banqueting house 
as it is, to be fed, to be encouraged, to be chastised and corrected, to receive forgiveness, and to partake of him, of his body, and of his blood, and to leave this place every Lord's day with faith strengthened, and hearts full of praise to our God for the wondrous things that he has done, for the wondrous things that he's doing in my heart, and continues to do in his church to make us better worshipers, lively, and eager, and hungry to be filled, sorrowful, and even depressed to be made joyful and to receive his peace. These are the things that happen when we worship. And let's strive and get this book. If, if you want to get into it, it's a good read to instruct our hearts to make this day the best of all days and awake each Lord's Day morning eager anticipation, exclaim with the psalmist, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And we've got four minutes to spare, I'm done. Here's some of the topics from the book, and, and I may add some and may remove some, and uh, I'm still early on stages of this. But some of the topics we can look forward to, certainly next week, what happens when we worship? We want to look more closely about what really happens and it's more than just what we observe here, and it's more than what we just do here, but it's something that's going on that God does when we worship. And that alone should revolutionize when we come to the Lord's house. The brief theology of worship, we're going to spend a week, maybe two on that, the mechanics and the elements of worship, and then finally preparing for worship.